Well, uh, I was driving uh, the coaches and a friend of mine down in Brixton said, why don't you do the knowledge? And he gave me the blue book. He just got out and, and driving a cab. And uh, so I applied at a public carriage office at 109 Lambeth Road, filled in all the applications, had a medical, had a police sergeant come round the house and interview me. And then I started uh, the knowledge. My dad, Ronnie Grant, is 92. He's been the proprietor of Clapham North MOT for over 57 years. And towards the latter part of the 50s, he decided to become a taxi driver. It was in 109 Lambeth Road, the public carriage office, and it was like first come, first served. And I used to get up there at four o'clock in the morning but I'd never, I was never in the first three or four. There was always somebody waiting on the steps. They never opened till nine o'clock. Everybody lined up and got in the line. Then about quarter to nine, they opened the public carriage office and you went in, you booked your name in and you went down into the snake pit, they called it. It was a tiny little room. When they called my name, in I went and I had the same chat that he did. And he said, uh, take me from, um, the Jewel Tower to the Film Producers Guild. Well, the Jewel Tower is opposite the Queen's entrance and the Lord's entrance in Parliament Square. And the Film Producers Guild was, it was a straight, easy run up. Whitehall complied with the one way Trafalgar Square, lead by Charing Cross Road, turn right at Cranberry Street, turn left in up at St Martin's Lane, it's on the left. And that was it. I know how long it takes a cab driver these days to do yeah. It's about four years, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. How it long did it take you? Nine months, from start to finish. Ronnie eventually ran a fleet of about 40 taxis, all running from the premises of Clapham North. And of course, when you took this over, there was nothing here, was it? There was no, no. There was no there, office. There was no office. We built the office for a start. Yeah, they had a wooden shack over there. And then we got... The office was here when I was here. Yes, it was. I built, we built the office. What year did you reckon you built it? 19... In the 60s. In the 60s. Yeah, because yeah. then we, we had all the cabs out the road. Uh, they have these green shelters all around London where cabmen go and uh, eat. And I used to eat in the temple just off of Victoria Bank. And... Um, <clears throat> I met a guy called Layman, Jack Layman, and we decided that we'd buy a cab together. Uh, in the first year, we'd done 96,000 miles in the cab, and he liked night work and so did I, so we bought another cab. And then we got Damon on it, and then it went on from there. We moved into Stockwell Road, and, um, and then uh, from Stockwell Road, we went to... Uh, I heard this place was going at Clapham North. So we came up here, and agreed to terms with the owner, who was, he, he was um, running cabs, Parsons cabs. And so we moved into uh, 629 Cox Grove. Which is where we are now. Which is where we are now. When you, when you opened up Clapham North, when, when you moved from Stockwell, yeah. and you picked up the keys yeah. to open this, what was that feeling like? Uh, I don't know, I, I can't remember what the feeling is. I, all I can remember is that they had a lot of cabs with engines out and gearboxes out, and I thought this is going to be bloody hard work. And we were, this was all full up with old cars, wasn't it? Yeah. Crashes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't really walk in here. No. And it was, and it was dark. All, it was damp. cobbled. Yeah. I suppose I didn't bother to come to the back. No. But I, I remember towards the latter part of the 60s when you got quite ill. Yes, that's right. I was working too hard, and actually I took too many codeine in too short a time, not realising, and I vomited a load of blood and got carried in, to, got taken into St James's, where they gave me six pints of blood, and in one of those was infected hepatitis. So then I went into a um, room on my own, into confinement, and uh, I was in there quite a long time, really. 
And all I had to drink was keep drinking your water. Water, water, water. I did, when I was laying there, I thought if I get out of here, I'm going to do everything I wanted to do. And one thing I wanted to do was go motor racing. During his life at the garage, Ronnie was not only a taxi driver, but in his spare time, he started his hand at motor racing. And at the age of 40 in 1967, raced against all sorts of young stars. He drove a Formula Super V. Super V had come out and I heard through the grapevine that Lola cars uh, had a chassis but no engine and gearbox. So I went up and done a deal with a guy who was running Lola's at the time, Derek Ongaro, who was the official starter for the F1s. You know, he started them on the plan. And um, he said, well, bring it all up and we'll have a deal. So that's what I did. So that's where I met Patrick, Ed and John Barnard. And what did they think of you when you turned up? Well, they thought, he's an old boy. I was about well over 40. He's not going to do very well, and that was it. But you probably met them at Eat Humble Pie, didn't you? No. Nah. They? they knew, didn't they? At the end of the day, you don't have to say anything. And then um, Patrick uh, done Formula 5000 with Ron Tornack. So Patrick designed the uh, Lola sports car, and John designed the Formula Ford. So they were both designers in their own life. Yeah. And you you still keep in touch with them? Oh yeah. Even now. Do you remember the first car that Patrick and John designed for you? Uh, it was a. Uh, it was. What happened was that when I finished uh, racing the Lola Super V, they were quite pleased with me, so they said you can keep the car, which was a space frame, which is a tubeless ch chassis, right? So John said, and I had this garage, so we came, brought it down here, and he said we can change the tubeless over to a monocoque, which was the latest thing to do. So that's what we did, and we called it after my lovely wife, Sheila, the Taurus, and John Barnard was a, a Taurus as well, so that's what we called it, the Taurus. And you won a few races in that? Yeah, yeah. Any particular race? Races well, we won, that... uh, I won a good Super V race in Nivelle in Belgium. Um, I won uh, two or three others. So then we moved on to Formula 3, which was very, very hard at the time racing against the likes of uh, Senna, Damon Neal, Johnny Herbert, Perry McCarthy, Martin Donnelly, uh, just to name a few. But you see, you were racing when those guys have actually, at the same time that those guys in present time would have retired. Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. But um, you're only as old as your food, aren't you? The worst time was um, when we was at Silverstone and um, We'd gone out on the morning practice and then we went out on the afternoon practice. And I, I came down uh, Hangar Straight, flat out, turned into snow, Stow Corner, and um, it, was just, uh, it was pouring the rain. It was dry, I think, and pouring the rain. Got on the wet and I was in slicks, so I spun. And I got on the grass and it was March, so I couldn't get out. I stepped out of my car. It was an international Formula 3 and a Belgium guy came along and he'd done exactly the same as I did. But he smashed the car onto me and as I stepped out, I got caught in my leg. And so um, I was lying on the flower. I hadn't had time to take my helmet off. Everything went black and I really did think that that was the end. But um, Marshall came along and lifted the car off. He said, you all right, Ronnie? I said, no. I said, my leg's uh, so he stay there. Here comes the doctor in the rover. And the doctor done exactly the same as we did. He spun. He wasn't driving the car. The marshal was driving it. He spun and hit us all again. And uh, it was nine months out of my life, really. And that was it. So next year, put the car back together and started again. Over the years, the arches in Clapham North became a hub of activity. Generations of families have had their car serviced with us, for this tradition continues today. What, what makes us different from any other garage? 
Well, it's what I've always thought and always I want people to be to treat how I, how I want to be treated. When my blokes you come in, they say, "Can we help you?" Not what you want. Can we help you? It's a nice, friendly garage. It's like being part of the family. So they always come back. The grandfather comes in, the sons come in, and the grandchildren come in, uh, and they come from miles around, really, because uh, they've always been with me, and they always the whole family's come back, and they don't get stitched up. We show people when their tyres are worn or when their brakes don't work or something or other, we show them and then they, nine times out of ten they say, can you do it? Yes, we can, so we, we, that's what we, we go on from there. You'd go in somewhere, wouldn't you? Oh yeah, we were going up to see the uh, Jersey Boys. Yeah, we're yeah, that was really good. Yeah. Can you remember Ronnie? Yeah. Do you remember something? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's got a brain like a... What about my wife sitting there? Well, come over, come over and say hello, Sheila. But you should have some fun with Sheila. I remember seeing the when you when you bought your E-Type Jag. Yeah, I, I borrowed got... it one day too. They couldn't believe it was. Yeah. They, um... Did you drive it? Yeah. 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 She had it for weeks. She <laughs> wouldn't I give smashed, it back. I smashed my little car. <laughs> No, and, you know, and, uh, she was working in a garage and they serviced her car and when she came down to Copthorne one night she drove off and I saw a pool of oil and I thought she's only going to get to about Mitchum and sure enough that's as far as she got. The engine seized up so I was on 24 hour breakdown I sent the boy out to get it and he got it and so the only other car I had to lend her was my e -tire. so I had to lend her that so So she's the only woman I know that can smash her, not smash her car up, but her car broke down when she got an e-time. She had a little old 1100, I think it was, or... I worked in the garage, when I drove in, they couldn't believe it. Yeah. Ethel, we called that. Yeah. Yeah, why, why did you call it Ethel? It's an E, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, E for Ethel, well done. We had a, a break in here. You know, which is you put the engines on and the exhaust went out there and up the road. Gas everything. Uh, <laughs> now Patrick used to run them at nine and ten o'clock at I night. I remember. Yeah. And, yeah. and then we had the neighbours up the road saying, how long are you going to run that engine? And it, it used to be here, yeah, the brake, the shed you, brake. you have got some very wise words about yeah. how to well, conduct yourself. What's, you what's only get out of life what you put in, right? And if you work hard, then you'll, you'll always get what you want. It's the, the people, the world don't know you're a living and the government don't know you're a living. Nobody owes you a living. You've got to get out there and make it yourself and do it yourself. It, it lies within everybody to, to do what they want to do. You know, and if you work hard, you want to get somewhere, you will do. Eventually, you'll strike it lucky or a lucky break will come your way and you'll be in the right place at the right time and you'll succeed. And if you only think positive all the time and not negative, you will succeed. I've never met anybody like him. He's wonderful. And um, as you get older, it usually fades, doesn't it? But he amazes me more now than he ever can. He's a realistic man, down to earth. It's, it's no mystery. Do you know what I mean? And he sorts things out and stuff like that. And what he says makes sense. A lot of people talk so much about it. You've got to work at it, haven't you? And you've just got to be better than the next one. Absolutely. And that, that goes for pretty much... Everything in life. Everything. Goes. Everything. Everything in life. In your choice of a partner, you're working hard. If two of you are pulling together, you'll get somewhere.